Hey guys, you're watching Dansky, the place to be to develop your creative skills. And in this video, I'm gonna be doing a walkthrough of one of my new pieces of photo art titled Splintered. Uh, I created this recently. You may have seen the speed art version on the channel. If you haven't seen it yet, then you can check it out up here. And what I'm gonna be doing is, this video is about an hour long. It's probably not aimed at beginners. So if you've never done masking before or used like brushes and things, it might be a little bit overwhelming, but this is the entire process from start to finish with me doing a voiceover over the top, just explaining what I'm doing at any given time. So hopefully this is helpful. I'd love to hear your thoughts and feedback in the comments if this kind of format it's helpful. I do this kind of artwork all the time and for me just to be able to throw on like a screen recorder while I'm doing it and then make content out of that, like that'd be amazing. So I'd love to hear what you think. If this format is helpful, if you learn anything, just let me know down below. And there's also a few things that you'll see in this video that I've actually done tutorials for already, like way back. So what I'm gonna do is add some cards on screen if I'm talking about a specific thing because there's a chance that in the Photoshop playlist that I may have already covered a specific tutorial on a specific technique. And there was about 14 images that went into making this piece of photo art. They all came from Adobe Stock, but you can get images from anywhere on the internet. Of course you can. But anyway, this is the entire process over the course of about 60 minutes. So we'll jump to the screen now and we'll just get started. Okay, so I'm off. I've got my new document. It's 3840 by 2160. I like to work at a size of 4K. Always makes a nice wallpaper. And the first thing I'm doing here is just really creating the scene. So beforehand, what I did, if you follow me on social media, then you may have seen this. I threw together a very rough idea. I tend to spend between 15, 20, maybe 30 minutes very crudely throwing all the images together, just seeing if they work. This one did, so I kind of took it forward. And you can see here, I'm just cutting out essentially the pieces that are gonna go and make up the main body of the composition. So we've got the background, we've got the clothing, we have the subject. And you can just see that I'm using the brush tool here and I'm using a mask to just brush away the neck and just put everything in the right position. And it's important to try and get the scaling right here as well. You don't want the, the head to be too big or the body to be too small. So if you need to use the original image like of this subject, for example, as a reference just to make sure it looks right, then that's one way of doing it. Another way is to just do it as best you think it is and then uh, just get someone else's opinion, someone who hasn't been staring at this for minutes or hours just to get them to see if anything looks a little bit off or just take a break yourself. You know, sometimes you can come back to this the day after and, and you see it completely differently. And what I'm doing here is I'm using the puppet warp feature in Photoshop just to kind of bring down the collar a little bit just so it's not as tall and then just trying to get the, the subject's head in position and just masking away part of the face here. So the collar just kind of comes up over part of the jaw. And I'm using Photoshop's soft round pressure opacity brush. As always, it's literally my favorite brush for everything with a hardness of 0%. And you can see it all looks very, very crude at the moment. This is how they always start out. So don't be disheartened if you've put in an hour or so into your composition and it, it doesn't look great. That's how a lot of mine start out as well. And it's not really until you actually see it all come together hours later that you really see the, the kind of uh, the fruits of your labor, so to speak. So everything does have a slightly jagged edge around it. And what I'm gonna do is try and throw up, as I say, some tutorials that I've done in the past to similar effects on screen. So in a moment, we're gonna start refining the hair. We can see lots of white kind of around the edge. That's no good. I've started doing this with the brush tool, uh, as you can see here. And then I had a bit of a, an aha moment and remembered that there is actually a much easier, better way to do this. Now, because with my composites, they're very dramatic and there's lots of effects and lighting and everything, we don't need to be too precise with it all. Like if you're doing something professionally, um, then you might need to spend a lot longer. But so you can see here, I'm just adding a colored background behind and then using the select and mask feature to just refine the edges. And you can see it very quickly detects the background and just removes it. But as I say, we don't need to be too perfect with this because of what we're using it for. And I've definitely done a tutorial on this actually 
that I will link at the top of the screen. Uh, I think it uses this same subject actually as well. So that's a really quick and easy way to cut out hair in Photoshop. Now I'm just brushing down the side of the cheek, smoothing out some of those jagged edges. And the great thing about doing this on a mask is you, you have flexibility. So with the eraser tool, it's, it's all permanent. Using masks, it's, it's nothing's permanent. I can just go back in and I can refine the edge later on. And the order that I do this, sometimes I'll do this kind of for my subject at the very beginning, like I'm doing here, very early on. Sometimes I'll leave it all jagged until it all comes together and then I'll go back like closer to the end and then really refine the edges like this. So I'm just using the brush tool with that soft pressure opacity brush, just brushing around the edges. Now the reason I use this a lot now more than the pen tool is because it just gives you a slight, slight feathered edge, a little bit of a blur, which is more reminiscent of what you would actually get. You wouldn't always get like your subject being perfectly pen tool sharp. Um, because it just looks photoshopped. So if you just add like a bit of softness to the edge, a little bit of a feather, a bit of a blur, then it just looks a little bit more believable. So this is the helmet I found. I mean, those three like reticles, I just couldn't resist the whole splinter cell kind of vibe. It just was too perfect. So I thought, great, this is gonna go over the head. And I'm just lining this up here. I think my subject was a little bit, uh, a little bit off to the side. So I'm just using rulers to line my subject up and try and make the whole composition feel as symmetrical as possible. And there's a little trick to find the center point in your Photoshop document. Just add a new layer, fill it with black, reduce it by 50% and then just swing it to one side. So there we go, just positioning that so uh, the mask fits around the nose and just taking a little bit of time to actually invest in my mind how the subject would wear this piece of armor, this helmet. You know, if you actually really kind of do something like this and you create these characters and you, you really try and pretend this is like a, a real thing from a game or from whatever it is or from a film and make it just feel more believable and just decide in your mind how it's believable, then, you know, what you create will be more believable. And again, I'm using the Puppet Warp tool. This is amazing. You just go up to edit, down to Puppet Warp, and you can literally just bend and warp anything into any position. It's probably one of the most valuable tools that I use for my composites in Photoshop. So you can see I was really able to kind of bend that to fit the nose there. And here I'm adding a blur. So I'm blurring the background. You can go up to Filter, down to Blur Gallery, and I believe this is Iris Blur. And what this enables me to do is to blur a part of the image. And you might need quite a powerful computer to get this to work. So I've blurred the image. And you've got different ones there. You've got iris blur, you've got field blur. And then I'm just using the mask on that smart filter just to kind of make the outer areas of the scene less blurred. So. I'm trying to create like depth of field here. So as the, the camera moves further away, things in the background of the scene, they just become more blurred. This is really good because it accentuates the subject and puts a lot more focus on what I really want people to pay attention to, which is the subject. And that's where I spend a lot of my time in this, this um, composition, focusing my attention is making the subject look as authentic and as awesome as possible. Sometimes I spend a lot more time on the background as well, but for this one, I spent probably not very long at all on the background actually. It was a pretty, a pretty simple one. The image of this background did a lot of the work. Now here you can see I'm using uh, lens flares. If you have a lens flare on a black background, just change the blending mode to screen and it will instantly remove the black and keep the flare. I've definitely done a tutorial on this as well. So you can create your own lens flares or you can find some awesome lens flares on sites like Adobe Stock. They just have them on a black background, just ready to go. And of course, a hue and saturation adjustment layer clipped to this lens flare. So we can go with the, uh, the splinter cell green. And just doing that for each of them here. I think the clipping mask didn't actually work, so I just applied the hue and saturation effect directly. And you can see I'm naming my layers like a good boy, because, you know, 
these get very complicated, please do name your layers. Um, it'll save you a lot of headaches further down the line when you're trying to find that one thing to change. And I've got all my images here. Now you can see I've organized all my images very nicely, uh, but typically it's a case of I will jump backwards and forwards from uh, Adobe Stock, which is where I get my images. But so if I need a certain thing, I just jump online, grab it, put it in. I've done all that in advance here. And, um, and here, this, this ginger lady has very kindly lent me some of her hair. So there was a strand of hair that just kind of had the right shape for how I wanted to use this. And I wanted to just bring in a slightly human element. So I didn't want it to be completely robotic. I wanted there to be some hair in there. So kind of like a bit, a bit man, a bit machine, or woman machine. And uh, it was ginger. Um, so it had lots of, uh, lots of color to it. And I thought, oh, I could take the color out of this and then make it like a brown or a black. This starts off quite badly. You'll see I kind of go around in circles a little bit with this. I definitely got this looking better initially in the, the, the preparation for this piece of work. But at the end, you'll see that, that I, just, I decided the hair looked terrible. So I actually just redrew the entire piece of hair myself, um, layered it on top of this. So you'll see that a little bit later on. You can see it looks it looks absolutely awful at the moment. I mean, you have this this subject coming together, and then just this bright, lazily cut out piece of ginger hair. So uh, you definitely you definitely get back what you put out with this. You know, if you put in a minimal amount of time, and <laughs> you try and cut corners, uh, it will it will show. Sometimes you can cut corners and get away with it, but um, yeah, <laughs> not in this case. There we go, I've got my um, custom hairbrush that I'm using to try and bring back some of the detail into the hair. It's really not going as well as I'd hoped, as you can probably tell, but I can't wait to show you when I actually draw the hair later on. In fact, I think that drawing of the hair probably needs its own separate video because it's, it's such an awesome technique and you can use it in retouching any subject that you cut out. Sometimes it's just a case of you can't cut out the subject from the background because it's just too complicated. So you actually need to just cut the subject out as best you can and then redraw some of that hair back in. Yeah, so, oh God, I'm still going. Okay, I'm still going with the hair. <laughs> it does look quite terrible. Okay, well, there we go, desaturating it. So we're getting more towards the kind of browns, blacks color. Nope, nope, that is, that's looking terrible. But don't worry, I do get there in the end. Oh, wow, okay, that's very different. Ah, there we go. Black, blue, no, probably not the blue. Could go with green hair to match the, the lens flares, but no. So I think at this point, hopefully I decided to just leave that where it was, give up temporarily and then come back to that. I think I did. Ooh, this is cool. So this is a 3D illustration that some awesome human being created of like a robot on the internals. How you would create this, I have no idea. Look at the detail. But it was perfect because it's it matches the exact same form of my subject. So a lot of the time it's a case of trying to find images that would really kind of work together. And the subject in this robot just looking straight at the camera, it's just perfect. So I needed to line the eyes up here. So I'm trying to line this up so it looks correct. If I can get the eyes of the robot lined up with the eyes of my subject, I know that it's gonna stand a better chance of looking a bit more authentic and not really rubbish. So now I'm just using a mask on that exoskeleton layer that I've added in. Uh, I called it exoskeleton because I thought that, that sounded pretty badass. And we're just brushing this back in here. Again, if you've got that, uh, I've got that soft feathered brush. Nothing hard in here. I always keep my hardness at 0%, pretty much all the time unless I need it for a specific thing. It just helps you blend things together. Zoom in loads and loads and loads, get a nice small brush. And we're just changing the blending mode here to try and get that to blend a bit more, be a bit more subtle, less silvery, more kind of black robot internals. And you can see the layers starting to really add up now. And this is how I work typically. I always have like my scene folder, my subject folder, 
I then sometimes have uh, objects, so it might be other objects like a sword or a gun or something the subject is holding. Uh, I don't think I have that in this one. And then I have my post effects layer at the top. That's always purple. That's the, like, I think of that as like the magic layer because you can turn that off and it looks terrible. You turn it back on and all the lighting and effects and everything just, yeah. So that's very fun turning that folder off and back on. And you can see here, I'm just bringing in all of this exoskeleton detail into the subject's face. So I'm just using masking here. So if you've never done masking in Photoshop, um, then thank you for sticking to this point in the video. I think this is probably gonna be more suited to people who uh, have a little bit of experience with Photoshop, but I've definitely done a tutorial on masking. So check out the Photoshop playlist on my channel because I've definitely done masking before. Uh, and it's, it's a, an essential thing to know if you're into to doing this kind of art in Photoshop. So here I'm just kind of introducing a bit of black. This is just me really, really badly on a separate layer, just brushing in some black to kind of uh, extend part of that exoskeleton. It didn't quite cover the neck. So I'm just <laughs> adding in my own bit there. It's really badly done, but uh, you really won't see it in the, uh, the final product. So I've kind of roughly figured out how I want this exoskeleton to fit around the face not covering the nose or the mouth, but maybe going around it. But you'll see later in the tutorial that I actually need to really pay more attention to how is this exoskeleton really actually going to connect with this human face. Because at the moment it just looks like I've masked it two dimensionally really badly. So you'll see that a bit later on. Desaturating the face a little bit. and then desaturating the exoskeleton. I love saying that word. Exoskeleton. Exoskeleton. Okay, repositioning the really bad hair that will be good by the end. Just rotating that, just so it kind of fits where the subject's head would be. Okay, ah oh yes, we've got some background effects. So this is like shattered glass. Again, it's on a black background from Adobe Stock. Just change the blending mode to screen or lighten, one of those ones. Boom, removes the background, keeps the particles. It's an amazing way to add particles to a scene. And then you can just mask it, brush them back in exactly where you need them. It, uh, it's literally that easy. It makes it so easy. And then we've got some, I don't know what you call that, like dust mist particles or something. I've used it as kind of wind. So like the idea that there was glass, it shattered and now wind and whatever from outside is coming in again similar blending modes wow that's that's very dramatic some blending modes are a bit more dramatic than others but then it's just really fine-tuning the opacity on these two layers as well just to make them more or less pronounced oh and just adding a bit a little bit of blur as well oh motion blur so going up to filter down to blur motion blur because, of course, if this was like a piece of glass shattering, it would be moving, there'd be motion. So adding that motion blur just makes it blur in a specific direction and just feel a little bit more believable. And again, I've got some mist set to screen blending mode. So it's just fog mist on a dark background, blends nicely over the top. And here you can see I'm starting to build out that post effects folder at the top labeled purple. So color lookup, that's great. It's a great way to add like an entire different filter effect to your scene. You can turn day into night, night into day. I've done a tutorial on that one as well. Um, so definitely play around with some of those. So this is what I'll do frequently is I'll just uh, add things to the post effects folder and then turn that off to work back on the actual components themselves and then turn it back on, see how it looks. And here what I'm doing is just, and this is something I'll do through all of my composites, is you have to match all of the different things you're adding into your scene. They have to match. So the helmet, the subject, the, the jacket, piece of armor she's wearing, it, uh, you have to try and match the lighting. And if the lighting doesn't match, which is quite often the case, you have to add in your shadows, your highlights, and all that stuff yourself so it all fits together. If you've got the light hitting the subject's face from the right, and then you also have the jacket lit from the left, it's not gonna make sense. You need to have your, you need to decide where your light source is 
and then try and create your highlights and shadows based on that. So here I'm just adding some more glows to the helmet. You can literally create new layers, brush in green, change the blending mode to something like hard light or overlay. And then what are we doing here? So you can see the layers really do start to add up. <laughs> and you can adjust the opacity on some of these color lookup adjustment layers as well because some of the effects can be quite, uh, quite overpowering. So again, we're doing a levels one here. And I think this is intended to just darken the left side of the subject if I remember correctly. There we go. So the light in this is kind of coming from the front, but then we also have some coming from that opening in the doorway that's shattered behind, or the window. Whatever it is that was glass that is now shattered glass. So we've just added a levels adjustment there. You can do levels or you can do curves, and then you just brush into or out of that layer mask. So there we go, we just turn it off and on. It's quite satisfying as well when you do this. And now you can see I'm just going in with the brush tool and just starting to refine a few of these things. The things that are sticking out, the jagged edges. As I say, there's no particular order that I do this. Sometimes I'll just do it as I go. Um, I kind of just throw music on when I make these and just, you just get lost in a completely different world and uh, I just kind of let my hand do the work. I'm just, I'm just along for the ride, really. So I'm using Select and Mask here to, I think I'm using Select and Mask anyway. Yeah, I'm using that to just shift the edge as well. So if you get a white edge around something, you can just use the shift edge to kind of shift the edge of your object in and it can trim off that white highlight around the edge. I've definitely done a tutorial on that technique as well. It's very, very useful if you have white all around the edge of your subject, you can just trim it off very quickly and even add like a slight bit of feathering to the outside as well. Okay, so here I'm kind of taking that, uh, that two-dimensional exoskeleton cyborg thing I've put on the face and I've thought, hmm, I actually need to try and blend all of these electronic components into the face in a way that looks believable. So I think in the end, I kind of had a few pieces sort of actually going into the skin as if she was literally connected. Whereas here it just looks like it's kind of placed on top and it doesn't really feel too believable. But don't worry, you'll see that get better and progress as the video goes on. Ah, so this is the part where I decided we're gonna take away part of the face, or not part of the face, part of the helmet, and then the exoskeleton is gonna follow up into that space. So we're gonna have a robotic eye. So as much as I love symmetry and I'd love to, I'd love to keep the three, uh, the three lights, the whole splinter cell thing for symmetry, we've gone with robotic eye. So I'm just zooming in, again, the same soft feathered brush, hardness of 0%. And I'm just masking this out of the helmet. So I'm using a smaller brush to do the edges and really get that detail. And then once I've decided that's where I exactly want to remove, I just make the brush a bit bigger. Using the left and right square brackets on the keyboard, you can quickly adjust your brush size. And then I use a bigger brush just to remove all of that. Just a bit more time, uh, time efficient. So there we go, we've taken a piece of helmet out and you can see I've cut around very specific parts as well, again, to make it feel believable. And then we're just brushing back in the exoskeleton. And I'm just drawing this around the nose. So I'm thinking, okay, how's this gonna fit around the nose? How's this gonna fit around the nose and the mouth? Because at the beginning, I wanted to keep these features of the subject in. Oh no, we've gone back to the hair. Okay, come on, Dan, leave the hair alone. We'll come back to that later. Oh, that looks so cool. That is such a fantastic illustration. Okay, so we're going back down here. So I'm gonna try and cut around these components. And the more time and effort that you do 
put into these smaller details, the more you write, kind of really consider how this all fits together and would this like, would this be legit? Would this actually like look good and be believable in a game or a movie or whatever? Those little details at the end, they all come together and they culminate to an overall more uh, effective piece of work, I think. So just going over masking the chin. I don't know what I did there. <laughs> Remove the chin. What on earth am I doing here? Am I bringing the chin up? I'm terribly sorry. I have no idea what I'm doing here. <laughs> ah, so this is me trying to use the puppet warp tool to bend the robot eye so it's positioned by the main eye. Because remember, we have to try and line all the eyes up, otherwise it looks weird. At the moment, the right eye is too close. And when I distorted it, you could see it lost being a circle, uh, which was a real issue for me. So I had to keep that circular. Puppet warp didn't work in this case. So what I ended up doing was actually, you'll see in a minute, I just distort the entire thing. So just go to edit down to transform and then you can hover over uh, like the corner points and hold command or control and then click with those keys held and you can actually distort something out of shape. That seemed to be the, the, the better way of doing it. So here we go, you can see me doing that technique now. And yes, it does pull the machinery out, which kind of messes up what I've done already. So, but sometimes this just happens, you have to go back and remask and blah, blah, blah. It's a very, uh, this whole thing is a very, very backwards and forwards process, I find. It's definitely a wibbly wobbly line. It's not just a straight line. Yeah, so you can see me really considering now how the exoskeleton is gonna link with the face and apparently at this point I've just decided, you know what, screw it, we're just gonna get rid of it all here. The whole chin thing wasn't working. Yeah. Just going around the lips. I just I just wasn't feeling it. You'll see I actually remove quite a lot in the end and I think it was definitely the right thing to do. I guess I'm thinking at this point, adding green for some reason. Ah, so I'm adding the green and I believe I'm going to apply this to, yes, around the lights on top. So I've set this green color fill there to overlay and I'm just brushing green in just to kind of add that glow to the helmet. So these lights, they're pretty bright in here. So I'm thinking, okay, how are these lights going to affect what's around it? What is around it? The helmet. Well, okay, I need to add like a subtle glow, 60% opacity to the helmet. It's those smaller details that will really make a difference. So we're just brushing in on that mask now. And you can see pretty much everything I'm doing is on is on uh, layer masks attached to some kind of layer or adjustment layer, which just gives me the flexibility to constantly go back and uh, and just just uh, tweak things. We're adding more green now. I'm not entirely sure why. Uh, okay, so we're going to add a bit of green to the shoulders. These lights, apparently, they're pretty bright. A little bit on the face here. And then I'm gonna drop that opacity really low. I don't want that to be too pronounced. So what have I gone with? 15%? So really, really subtle detail. And then I'm just blurring those lens flares slightly so they're not, uh, not perfectly sharp. And I'm just adjusting the levels on the exoskeleton. So you'll see gradually as I go through this, it's a case of the helmet, the jacket, the exoskeleton. I'm trying to blend the lighting between all these three different images so they feel like as one, like they were all photographed or created in this scene. 
So you can see our post effects folder is getting filled up now with color lookups, color balance. Color balance is a fantastic adjustment layer to blend different, um, different images together. You can adjust the highlights, the midtones, and the shadows for different colors. So color balance is definitely an, a must learn. So here we go, I'm adding some green into the iris of the robotic eye. And I think I do a little bit around the edge as well. So this is just a new layer using the same old brush we've been using at a really tiny size, bright green. And I'm gonna blend this. I can't remember which blending mode I use in the end. And we're adding an outer glow. So you can right click, select your blending options, add that outer glow, a green outer glow. And now I've added that, um, that blending mode effect to that layer, anything else I draw on this layer is also going to have an outer glow, which is really cool because then I can see in real time how I actually, you'll see now, I draw this and it's already got that glow on it. Took me a while to get this straight, even with a pen tablet, which is really like a, a, an absolute must for this kind of thing. So you can go up and turn with the brush tool, you've got the smoothing option. I turned that up to 100%. And you can see it kind of really did help me just get that much smoother. I don't like to brush with that normally at 100. I keep it like 10 or lower. But if you need to do smooth lines or curves, just crank that up to 100 and uh, it'll help. I'm just refining that here. I'm trying to get that as circular as possible because if that was not circular, it's something that would, <laughs> would really bug me. And then I think I'm just adding more glow here. Yeah, just a bit more glow. A very slight glow for this eye because it's not like, this eye isn't full splinter cell, but it needs a little bit of glow. Oh no, we're back to the hair. Oh, okay, change the blending mode. That seems to look better. So that was a pretty quick, a quick win. <laughs> Sometimes you just do this, you'll create something, it'll look terrible and you'll just go back to it, change it something as simple as a blending mode and be like, oh, that looks, that looks much better. Adding more color lookup adjustment layers. I do stack these, like quite a lot of them on top of each other. It does get a bit crazy sometimes, but it doesn't matter. You know, the important thing is that you get the, the look that you're going for and if you have like 50,000 adjustment layers, then you know, so be it. I mean, it probably makes things very complicated, but. So here we go, we've got some more lights on a black background. Remember I said before, if it's on black, just change the blending mode to screen or lighten and voila. You can see it will just blend over the top. Come on down, I said voila. Okay, so I'm not doing the blending mode yet. I'm just distorting it to match the perspective. There we go. Voila, so there we go, I've done, oh, we've gone with color, color dodge instead. So that's quite punchy. I'm just bringing the opacity down, adjusting the color. So I wanted those lights to fit the perspective of the scene, so I had to kind of distort them first. I've changed the hue and saturation. I've added a bit of a blur to them as well, Gaussian blur, and color dodge is the blending mode. So screen would have been a bit more subtle, but I wanted something a bit more, a bit more punchy, a bit harder. And we're just changing the color again here with a hue and saturation adjustment layer. You can see we've got a very uh, bluey kind of blue with a hint of green as the theme for this. So having red lights just didn't didn't really fit for me. And I'm just working on the background as well, probably probably making that more blue by the looks of things. It's a very kind of space sci-fi kind of scene. So there we go, adjusting levels again. And you can see sometimes it creates these hard edges. You can see this hard edge here. So it's just removing that hard edge from the image. And you can do that again with a mask and a nice soft feathered brush.
So just more adjustment layers on the exoskeleton. There's quite a few there now. We've got two levels, one hue and saturation, and a brightness and contrast. You probably don't need all of that, but as I, as I say, if you end up stacking up loads of layers just to get the right look, then, you know, you go for it. There's no, no judgment here. And you can see these pauses in between are me really kind of stopping what I'm doing, taking a look at it and thinking, what's right, what's not, what's missing, what do I need to add? So if you can take a break for an hour or two hours or even sleep on it, definitely do, because you'll see things, trust me, you'll see things that you would have never have seen before. So this is a spotlight brush from Invato Elements. I love this set of brushes. You've got lots of different spotlights. You literally pick white, new layer, click, you have a spotlight. And I wanted some light coming in from the outside. And that was a great way to easily achieve that kind of effect. And I think I dropped the opacity in the end as well. It's quite punchy at the moment. Light flare. And just stretch that across. So it kind of fits with the whole uh, glass explosion wind thing that we've got going on. And it's just trying to find the right blending mode. Sometimes it's quite tricky. Maybe that one. I think in the end I just bring the opacity down a lot because it was just too bright. It was drawing too much attention away from the subject doing this. And here I'm just adding a new layer with a white brush and the blending mode of color dodge and just brushing in like a highlight on the door frame. Just so if light was coming in from outside, you'd have this highlight around the edge of the door frame. Of course you would. And I think at some point as well, I'm gonna start darkening other parts of the scene as well. So the more you understand about lighting and kind of how it works, or if you do photography or something like that and you have light coming from one direction and how that casts shadows, then that's gonna really help. And that's something that I'm still um, developing my knowledge of now. So there we go, we've got uh, that background blur. I'm just kind of bringing that forward a little bit. So the subject and the edges of the scene are in focus. And then as you move further back through this corridor, this like sci-fi tunnel, it just gets more and more blurry. And again, we're doing color balance. Remember that's an awesome adjustment layer to fine tune the shadows, midtones, and highlights and the colors within those different ranges. So there we go. It looks nice and tidy now when you collapse all the folders. And I think this is me taking a break Again, what's missing? <laughs> We've still got a lot of work to do. We've still got a lot to do. Yeah, we're back to the hair. Okay, so I've got my hair brush. I love this brush, it's incredible. And I'm actually on a new layer with black, just drawing in new hair. Because I decided that it looked a bit terrible. I mean, look at that bit at the top. It's just, it's just lazy. So I'm cutting away to that bit and then getting ready to draw all of that area in. So rather than going over the top of it, I'm actually just drawing the hair in. And this takes a lot of practice. Again, this is something that I'm still really developing. If you need to use another image as a reference to kind of see how hair flows and, and you'll know that if you, if you kind of pull hair out in a really weird way and it goes against the flow of hair, it, it'll look quite strange, but here what I'm doing is I've added another layer and I'm now using white. And this didn't work at the beginning. It was actually cutting out of the image for some strange reason. And I think that's because I needed to move the layers a bit further up. So they were being affected by something above it. So I moved them to the top of the uh, subject folder. Now I can brush in that white. So these are kind of like very subtle highlights on the hair. So it's quite tricky, it takes a lot of practice. And using a tablet, like a graphics tablet is, I would say almost essential for doing this. I would not wanna do this kind of work with a mouse because you get control of things like pen pressure. So you can see at the start and the end of every brush stroke, it's a lot softer. 
and then the middle is a bit, uh, a bit more pronounced. That's because of the way I'm brushing as well. And I'm gonna throw in a few at a slightly bigger brush size. This is all still hardness of 0% on the brush. It's that same soft feathered brush, just with a few other settings tweaked. Now the temptation here would be to make the brush much larger and just do it all really, really quickly and get it over with, but it will look terrible. So do a mixture of very small brushes to slightly less smaller brushes. Just mix it up a little bit, just by like a few pixels here and there. So you can see here I'm doing some one pixel brushes. And then I might do like some two and three, maybe a four or a five, but then I wouldn't go too big, otherwise it will just look a bit rubbish. And to be honest, I think the hair is something I could have spent hours on. I could have spent hours working on that and really layering that up even further. But uh, yeah, I think it got to a place where it was looking, it was looking okay. And just blurring it a little bit. So blurring the hair just so it all looks really soft. We don't get any jagged edges. Trying to blend the, uh, the exoskeleton to the face here. It didn't really work. Okay, taking a step back, having a look, what's not right, <laughs> jumping back into it. So there's still a lot more work on the exoskeleton to be done, like especially around the face. But for the moment, apparently I'm just playing around with more color filters because that's what this needs. And here I'm trying to add a gradient to the layer mask, so black to white gradient. So it starts off using the color balance that's much more kind of warm on one side and then cold on the other side. I think I uh, kind of either got rid of this or made it really, really subtle in the end, even though it does look kind of cool. Still playing with the adjustment layer. which is adding some curves here to kind of darken certain areas and make other areas lighter. And just bringing the width in on those lens flares. This, um, this did pose a few problems. You can see those weird kind of edges and boxes around the edge of the lens flares that kept popping up. Sometimes when you blend something that has a black background using screen or lightened blending modes, sometimes you will get a box around the edge that you'll just need to go and mask away. But I think at this point it was a case of like, the concept was pretty much done, the character was in the scene, all the elements, I think most of the images, if not all of them have been added now. So it's really just a case of kind of taking a step back, looking at it, refining it, and just working on the small details. And you'll see as we go through the video, there's still a lot more work that I'm gonna do on the exoskeleton, particularly around the cheek. adding more color lookup adjustment layers. I think with this one, I was quite indecisive. I just couldn't decide exactly which way I wanted to go. If I wanted it to be really blue, really future sci-fi, or whether I wanted something warmer. So I ended up just stacking up a bunch of adjustment layers. And in the end, I think I go and delete some of them actually as well. But it's good to experiment. I've got no idea what I'm doing here. I don't think we keep this in or we, if we do, it's really subtle, but um, yeah, it's good to experiment. So just going back through, blurring things that need blurring, just adjusting opacity, balancing all the different elements within the scene.
My goodness, I do enjoy doing whatever I'm doing at the moment, playing with these adjustment layers. <laughs> okay, so taking another step back. So now I'm gonna try and introduce some color into the exoskeleton because there was color in the original. So you can see here, I'm trying to take all of that color from the original and probably make it green or blue. So I'm adjusting just the reds, the yellows and the cyans here. I can go into all those different specific colors and the blues and I can make all of them green. So I can make the reds green, I can make the blues green, I can make the yellows green. I can go in and make everything green in the hue and saturation adjustment layer. So that was great. I was able to pull out all of that, that color and use that color in the original and make it all green. So now the cyborg exoskeleton suit on the body has all this color added to it without me manually having to go through and literally draw in color, like kind of like I did with the iris. So that was, a, that was a huge time saver. That would have taken me a long time to go and do that. So now we're just adding shadow around the chin and the jaw. That's shadow from the collar. So again, it all comes back to lighting. You know, where's the light source? How is it casting shadows? Especially when you're blending two different images together, does one crew image does one image sit on top of another image? Will it cast a shadow? It's that kind of thinking. Oh, and now we're back to the cyborg. Okay, we're back to the exoskeleton on the face. So you can see me now really starting to think, how is this going to connect with the face? Nope, that bit there can't go over the lip. So I think we're just going to have to get rid of a massive chunk of this and in the end I decided that it was just it was just it looked better and it was easier as well to stay away from the nose and the lips and I'm going in with a nice small brush now I don't want to have too much of a feathered edge remember this is still machinery so the brush is four pixels in size hardness of zero percent you could bring the hardness up to like 50 percent for something like this because it is machinery so it will be much more clean cut than any like human organic matter or something or you can just keep it at zero percent hardness and go super super small so you can see I'm just kind of lining this all out and then using the bigger brush to just go and remove all the excess so there we go just masking all of that out so we're starting to get somewhere now and bringing some of this back in and then these metal kind of wires or whatever they are, just thinking, okay, maybe these could, maybe these could go into the face. Maybe they could connect to the face somehow. So there's that kind of link between man and machine. Yeah, this definitely took, uh, this took a lot of work, this one, a lot of thinking as well. Not that thinking is a bad thing, just, Took a lot of mental energy <laughs> to really think about how this was gonna was gonna connect with the face and look good. And here I'm trying to add some very subtle shadowing as well. So of course we have the components on top of the skin, so there would be a very slight shadow. Even if it is really, really slight with very little opacity, you would have something there. So it's that kind of tiny detail that just makes it feel a bit more like the exoskeleton is actually sat on top of the skin. There we go, naming all my layers. As I say, like a good boy, well done, Dan. And then we're just adding in some black here with adding in some shadowing so you can do this with levels and curves adjustment layers or you can just literally make a new layer get black or another color for your shadow and brush that in and then just keep it as is or use a blending mode adjust the opacity so i'm just accentuating those shadows there are various ways to to do it you can kind of dodge and burn as well but as i say these shadows are really really important OK, 
Okay, so I think at this point I decided that I needed these components to somehow connect into the face. This is a bit, this is makeup. I think this is makeup, so I don't think that's like a real, a real injury. So if you are a bit squeamish, it's, it's just makeup, it's okay. But I wanted some kind of uh, like wound to represent where these metal components did connect to the skin. So I'm just kind of brushing this around here. And I probably could have spent more time doing this as well. But you see, I do this. <laughs> that looks weird. I do this for all of them. So all of these four components that do connect to the skin somehow, I'm just duplicating that layer, moving it to where they would connect. And we've got two more down here as well. So it's a really subtle detail, but something that I just, I really wanted to include. So just brushing around the edge, again using masks and the same brush we've been using through the entire video, duplicating that one just because of laziness. And then I'm unlinking the layer with the mask here and actually flipping this around. I want a bit more of the red in there, less of the kind of blue purpley colors from that, that makeup wound. And then just kind of hopefully squaring these off a little bit. So they look a bit too pronounced at the moment. Hopefully I go back and fix that. Do I go and fix that? I hope so. Oh, making them darker, that, that definitely helps. I think they're a little bit too pronounced on the, the bottom ones. Oh no, I think that's what we're getting, unfortunately. Oh, you can see once you add like all the all the layer effects and everything, it's pretty, it's pretty unnoticeable. I think I was doing this quite quickly as well because I was conscious that I was screen recording, whereas normally when I do this, there's no uh, there's no device recording my screen or anything, so I can spend literally hours upon hours. So this took about three hours in total, um, but normally some of my pieces of work can take anywhere from four, five, six hours. I think the longest is about just over 12 hours. So I'm gonna try and record a lot more of these now. Um, just because I think it'd be really cool to show you guys the process, if you're interested. But uh, yeah, it's gonna take a bit of getting used to for me being recorded. Okay, so I'm just adding some more shadows in here. Again, just new layer, black brush tool, brushing in more shadows around the collar, trying to refine the collar on the subject there. Taking a step back. Now I actually recorded this over several sessions and after the first session, I thought, you know, we're done. And then I can realized I hadn't done any of the lighting on the helmet, which you'll see me go back and do, hopefully soon. So I add shadows to the left side of the helmet because at the moment I haven't added any. And it's that kind of thing that until you actually take a break from it and go back and have a look or you get someone to give you another opinion, you will miss things that are really obvious. This just happens. <laughs> Sometimes a fresh pair of eyes is, uh, is a good way to go. Okay, so I'm thinking. I'm still thinking. Have I noticed it? Yep, I think I've noticed the helmet. Okay, so you can see now I'm gonna start to brush in that levels adjustment layer to darken the left side of the helmet because remember the light is coming from kind of like the front to the left, no, sorry, the front to the right. And we have that kind of crazy light burst coming in through the side as well. So I want that left side of the subject, the helmet, the jacket to be slightly darker. And there's a weird halo effect going around the edge as well. So those lens flares again, they were causing, they were causing some problems, but you know, with, as with any problems, whether it's Photoshop, Illustrator, it's just a case of like trying to solve that problem. Just sometimes just tinkering around. I don't know what I'm doing here, trying to cut around the lens flare. That's a terrible idea, but it's just problem solving. And I think, uh, I think I got a solution to this in the end. I can't remember what it was. Maybe it was just that, extending it out, changing the blending mode. You know, there's loads of different things. A lot of this comes with experience, but the more problems you solve, you know, the more lessons you learn and you'll just know these things for future, so. So 
So just tinkering with different blending modes, different techniques, moving the lay maybe the layer position around, maybe it's above or below a layer that's causing problems. So you can see here, what I did was move the entire group out of the subject folder into the post effects folder. And whilst I normally wouldn't do that, um, because if I move the subject, I then have to consciously remember to go and move the uh, lens flare layers and groups. It won't just move with the subject automatically, but by doing that, it completely fixed the issue. So all that time I spent trying to get rid of those boxes and cut around a lens flare, I just needed to move the folder into the, the folder at the very top, the post effects folder, and that seemed to fix the issue. So we're just doing a little bit more. So this is probably, I think, me problem solving a bit here as well. Sometimes if you can't find a specific layer or you're trying to select something that's causing a problem, just go through all your different layers, turn off the layers that aren't related to the problem. And by turning all the layers off, you can then isolate which layer is causing a problem. And we're just working on those shadows here. Remember, lighting, super important. The helmet is pretty, pretty chunky and it is casting some shadows. Look at those layers. And I think we're, we're getting there, we're nearly done. Just going in now and refining a few more details. We're using some texture brushes. These again are from Envato Elements. And I'm just adding a bit, of, a bit of texture, a little bit of grit to the subject's face. I think she looked a little bit too clean before because it was a, a model shot in a studio. And this cyborg is kind of like missing half of a face. You know, there's a there's a glass door or window shattering. I feel like she just needed a little bit of um, a little bit of a distressed texture on the face. Whether this could be like uh, just scarring or something or whatever, I just felt like it needed something. So I've added that with black on a separate layer using a distressed texture brush. And now I'm going to liquefy this just to. This is a two dimensional texture but it bends around the lip so I want to make sure that the texture bends around that top lip as well so I'm just liquefying this so you can see that bend there and I could have probably done this for a few more as well just to kind of match the contours of the face I could have probably done a bit more on the nose as well because the subject you know they have depth all over their face noses cheeks lips all sorts of features and this is a two-dimensional brush and we need to kind of make it feel a bit more like it fits actually on the face and here I'm just using bevel and emboss to add some highlights and shadows to that so it just again gives it a little bit of depth lifts that black that flat black off the face and I've adjusted the lighting to match my scene so the highlights are coming from the sort of right side shadows are on the left drop the opacity down quite a lot so it's not too pronounced quite subtle but yeah, by the looks of things, I think we're at the end. And there we go. So there's a look at the process for creating the splintered piece of photo art in Photoshop. Guys, if you've got any questions, please do let me know down below. I'd love to hear what you liked and disliked about this format and it will really help me tailor future videos. But like this video if you did enjoy it. Take care and I'll see you next time.